This Week on Quadriga, Refugee Tragedy, Europe in the Dock. Last week's shipwreck off the Italian island of Lampedusa focused attention on the thousands of people who risk their lives every year trying to reach Europe's shores. People are fleeing hunger, poverty and civil war from countries across the Middle East, Asia and Africa. Now politicians and human rights groups are debating whether to tighten Europe's borders or make it easier for refugees to arrive safely. But is Europe doing enough to improve the situation in poor countries and to get to the root of the problem? Your host this week, Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. It was only a year ago that the European Union won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's a very different story these days as the institution is being heavily criticized for violating the very same principles that it won the award for. So now the question is how and if the Lampedusa tragedy will affect EU asylum policies. And we will look at this very intricate and complex issue on today's show together with three experts who've been following this issue very closely. Welcome to Christian Jakob, who is an editor and reporter for the German daily newspaper Die Taz, where he writes primarily about migration issues. Michael Stürmer is a renowned historian and the chief correspondent for the German newspaper Die Welt. Previously, he was the director of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. And Laura Lucchini, who is an Italian journalist writing for various new newspapers, such as the Italian L'Inchiesta and the Argentinian newspaper La Nación. Welcome to you all. Michael Stürmer, a tragedy indeed, which occurred off the coast of Lampedusa. 300 people, at least 300 people died, mostly from Eritrea and Somalia. And this incident, this tragedy, has kicked off and sparked a very emotional debate about EU asylum policies. Is this debate long overdue? Um, it would always be with us because this is a problem without, an, uh, without a solution. There's no straightforward solution. What you said in the beginning, it's a tragedy. And tr the, 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 the essence of a tragedy is that in the end, uh, the stage is full of uh, blood and misery. Um, if we do nothing, this movement is going to increase. It's a huge secular uh, I mean, the dimension of a century uh, exchange between, or exchange, uh, the, Africa is sending its toiling masses to Europe, often in the hope of uh, being welcomed or at least being uh, tolerated. And this is, of course, possible to a limited extent. Where to put the limit? Nobody has the faintest idea. The controversy is raging very high and, uh, by, and at the same time when Europe uh, on its own has a number of problems mostly related to demography. And we will look at those problems and also why these refugees are taking these incredible risks to come to Europe. Uh, Christian Jakob, this is, not a rel this is not a new phenomenon, uh, is it? We're talking about it now as if this is a relatively new phenomenon, which it isn't. 25,000 people have been killed in the past 20 years trying to get to uh, Europe from impoverished countries. Um, why do you think this tragedy, which has occurred, wh why do you think uh, such big emphasis is now being focused on the Lampedusa tragedy as opposed to the previous ones. Mm. Well, it is true that there has been immigration for 20 years that is not being uh, allowed to get in. There has been shipwrecking all the time and there has been many uh, drownings. But this one is the biggest and I think that's the reason why Europe cannot continue to ignore uh, what is happening in the Mediterranean anymore. And uh, if, if we look at the asylum claims, these are the biggest numbers of asylum claims in Europe since uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. 300,000 uh, people have been uh, applying. Do you think, what do you make of this? Uh, is, is the problems, have, have the problems grown or, or is it just a, is a different phenomenon that we're talking about? Well, it is true that at the moment we are facing the biggest asylum claims in the last decade, but uh, in earlier, earlier years there have been much higher numbers and um, Europe 
took the consequence to try to prevent refugees from coming in. The, we can observe a changing in the European migration policy from about 1990, 1992, um, trying to prevent people from claiming their right to asylum. Europe uh, states that it is a, a space of protection for people who are politically persecuted. All European member states bound themselves to the Geneva Refugee Convention. All are saying that they are giving, they are offering asylum to those who need it, but at the same time, no European country has opened up a legal access uh, for asylum seekers. There is no way to enter to Europe and to, to, to try to take advantage of the, of the asylum right that is uh, guaranteed by the European um, well, constitution and by the European uh, um, international treaties that the European countries have. Um, so fewer legal claims for the, uh, for the refugees to, to call upon the EU for asylum. Let's look at Italy, Laura Lucchini, a country you're from, obviously. Um, a country that is, plays a very pivotal role here in the European Union when it comes to migration issues. 30,000 migrants have reached Italy only this year, this year alone. And Italy is complaining. It says it is unfair that it is supposed to, share, it is supposed to bear the burden and pay the cost. Uh, and is asking its EU partners to share that burden and is asking for, mon for more money. Is that the solution? More money? Yeah, of course, it's also an economical uh, problem. Uh, uh, Italy uh, is asking for uh, more support from the European Union and that uh, means also more money. Uh, they, there's a huge sense of frustration in Italy because uh, the, the country, the people feel that they, they have been doing a lot uh, to accomplish with the targets of the European Union, but when it comes to an emergency, the European Union is not helping Italy. Uh, of course, uh, you have to put it, this in, in situation, in a context. Uh, Italy is, uh, uh, find itself uh, in, a, in a strong economic crisis uh, and find itself also in a, in a constant political crisis so the people are, are frustrated and uh, I think the European Union should, should point this issue uh, in, a, in, a, in a joint way just because it's really difficult to deal with it with, the, with the all different laws in different countries. And in a joint way is what the EU interior ministers have tried in Luxembourg. They have failed to formulate a common EU asylum policy. Italy is not the only country here, of course, that is in the focus, Michael Stürmer. Germany is also another country that is very much uh, looked upon when it comes to the migration issue. Um, the president of the EU parliament, Martin Schulz, says, who himself is a German, says Germany must do more, must take in more uh, uh, refugees. The interior minister, Hans-Peter Friedrich, uh, though, says not at all. Germany is already doing its fair share. It's taken in as times, as four times as many refugees as Italy. Does Germany need to do more here? Well, Germany is the strongest economic power, but Germany is also very central, and all the, it's at all the crossroads of Europe, but almost all the crossroads of Europe, and there is, of course, a kind of moving limit uh, to what Germany can do and will do without upsetting uh, the situation at home. It's all very well to, uh, in a well air-conditioned room in Strasbourg to be very generous and it's a very different thing if you go to Hasenbergel in Munich or to other places uh, where we had very, very serious concerns during the mid-1990s um, when even the Oktoberfest was under threat of not being able to be held and celebrated um, and that Tragedy. really... Well, that was for Ude, the very popular mayor of Munich, that was the tipping point when he said enough is enough. Uh, this is not a party political thing. It sounds when, uh, like a party political thing when uh, Martin Schulz says so, but this is, this is basically the president of a parliament which has no real, not the real character of, not the strengths and the responsibility of a parliament. It's all very nice. It's like me writing an editorial uh, and sounding good and uh, helpful. But the real problems are, of course, push and pull factors of the most serious kind. Uh, the, the most of Africa is in turmoil. There's war, poverty, climate change. There are, of course, criminal gangs who take advantage of these poor people, uh, mostly young men, 
uh, who risk everything, including their lives, and pay a lot. It's, this is big business, among other things. It's all very well to display your bleeding heart, but you mustn't forget that there are very, very real and very serious tragedies behind it, all these movements and that there are no ready-made solutions. There are partial solutions, small solutions, 5%, 10% solutions. And the problem isn't so new. Ten years ago, the Spanish Coast Guard exceeded in numbers of vessels the Spanish fleet. And that, the reason is very obvious. But still, the issue remains, Christian Jakob. Uh, let's, let's stay with Germany here for a second. You may disregard what uh, the President of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz, said in calling upon Germany to do more. But he's not the only one by any means. Uh, Germany is the biggest country in the European Union with 80 million people. Um, in your opinion, Christian Jakob, uh, is uh, Germany failing in its uh, obligations here? Yes, morally it is failing for sure. Uh, Germany is one of the most important and biggest countries in the European Union and we can observe that in the last 10-15 years it has managed to push through its interests towards especially the southern European countries and the countries at, at the external borders of the European Union. It has established an asylum system within the EU that is extremely unfair and that is loading the entire burden of the immigration influx to the, to the countries at the external borders. We have, it, is, it is true that the numbers of asylum seekers that arrive in Germany are rising. There will be about 100,000 in this year, but at the same time, uh, hardly any of them can stay here because Germany and the other Central European states have set up a regulation which uh, only allows asylum seekers to really claim asylum in the country where, where they enter the European Union, which is generally one of the countries at the Mediterranean coast. The so-called Dublin II so regulation. Dublin II, now the Dublin III regulation. And uh, this is by no means according to the economic power uh, of the Central European states. So what do you make then of the remarks on the part of the German Interior Minister, Hans-Peter Friedrich, mm -hmm. who says, uh, well, aren't we already taking in four times as many people as Italy? Is he, is he incorrect? It is, well, it is correct that there is a higher number of uh, asylum applications here in Germany, but this, is not, this, does not, this does not mean that there is a higher number of uh, asylum grants in Germany. Uh, actually, Sweden is one of the countries that is accepting most refugees within the European Union. The uh, United Nations Commission on Refugees is always, um, is always uh, referring to Sweden, saying that if all countries of the European Union, including Germany, would, relative to their population, take as many refugees as Sweden, the UNHCR wouldn't have a problem to distribute, distribute the people in highest need anymore. But Sweden is also sending very, very serious signs of distress and unrest. And there is, you can study, especially around Stockholm and in the south of Sweden, you can study what happens if the balance between uh, indigenous population and refugee population is somewhat reaching a tipping point from, and after that tipping point, things get out of control and get pretty dangerous for the social fabric. And let's talk about the tipping point, Laura Lucchini, because as Michael Stürmer suggested, the main reason perhaps why EU countries are reluctant to take in more refugees are for domestic reasons. Uh, uh, in Italy, the same. We've had the rise of far-rightist parties who have yeah. played upon the, this issue. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the xenophobic party Lega Nord played a role, in particular when in 2002, when this the new immigration law in Italy was uh, was approved. This, uh, this law, the Bossifini law, uh, takes his, his name from uh, the two leaders. Uh, Umberto Bossi who was the leader of the, this xenophobic party and the post-fascist leader of Alianza Nazionale, uh, Gianfranco. Francofini. They, they are no more in politics, but the, and this, this law is, according to uh, human rights organization, uh, really, really bad. And um, it, is, uh, uh, it, it gives uh, um, the, the order to, the, to the, uh, the villages that receives uh, uh, immigrants from the sea to denounce these, uh, those immigrants and uh, it allows to put in them in jail. So we have another problem, the jails are full and uh, now the president is talking about uh, uh, an, an amnesia, uh, to approve an amnesia. So there are uh, uh, 
political internal problems, uh, but in, in the last year, the, the xenophobic party lost a lot of uh, uh, support and the post-fascist party who was in the government doesn't exist anymore. So I wouldn't say that it, it pushing up this movement right now, it would, wouldn't be fair. And another domestic issue which uh, has been pointed out here is the economic crisis that is uh, um, you know, going through Europe. Uh, 26 million unemployed people in, U in the EU, mainly young people, uh, particularly in Spain, but also your country, mm -hmm. um, Italy. Do you understand the reluctance on the part of some politicians to say, look, we would like to take in more people, but our hands are tied here because we cannot, we, yeah. you know, we cannot even care for our, our own people. It, uh, it gives the perfect ground for a populist uh, right-wing uh, party to uh, to be bored. Uh, uh, but uh, yesterday, uh, a new right-wing party was announced in Italy, and uh, I mean, that, that's like that, that's a ground in which uh, some party could uh, could suggest that uh, we uh, were letting alone, uh, we have been let alone from by Europe on this issue, and uh, and uh, we, our we don't have work for our uh, people and we cannot accept uh, any other people. So that's, uh, the actual government has, has to pay attention with this, uh, with this argument to be, to be raised. I'm not so sure that it's just a left wing, uh, a right wing thing. I remember Oscar Lafontaine uh, making uh, a lot of hay out of this and talking about Fremdarbeiter. The famous, a famous left-leaning German politician, uh, uh, the Oscar former party Fontaine leader of is, the left party. Uh, the charisma was and still is indirectly through his wife um, the number one guy uh, for the Linke, especially in, the, in, in West Germany. The leftist party. Uh, Germany, yes. So I think that was a sign that this is, that that's where the extremes meet. But do you think that's a legitimate argument to say there are people, 300 people, dying off the coast uh, of Italy, people who risk everything to get here? And is the argument to say, yes, but we have a financial crisis that we need to deal with? Is that a legitimate uh, reason for you? It's so out of proportion. Uh, 300 people dying off the coast of Italy or Lampedusa is a terrible argument. It's a terrible thing to see. It, 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 it hurts every human being's feeling, I think. Um, at the same time, it is a symptom of a crisis or of Af Northern Africa, which we cannot solve. With, with no amount of money, no amount of development aid, no amount of uh, uh, police, you cannot solve these problems. You can help to contain them and that's really where we should do much, much more. But isn't the reality that people will still keep coming despite the risks? Well, for a combination of reasons. Of course, this terrible poverty, the, the fear of war. Uh, look at South Sudan. Look at the butchery that is happening. Uh, look at Mali, where, where we just about sort of avoided a major catastrophe. Uh, not thanks to the German government, but thanks to the French government. Um, these problems have a magnitude of which we see just the, 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 the harbingers, not much more. And there is much more to come. And there is, of course, the side of, the, of organized human trafficking. That's a very important part. It's not only that uh, you have the, 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 like a kind of disorganized misery. You have a very well-organized misery with people who make a lot of money out of this. Uh, and then they don't even deliver very often. Although the 300 coffins or the 300 dead corpses uh, in Lampedusa, I mean, they really hoped for some delivery. The same hope that drove millions and millions of Europeans to America uh, a century ago. No solution. No solution. I mean, real solution. We can always put some aspirin uh, into the problem, throw some aspirin to the problem and some millions to the problem, but that is not the solution. So, Christian Jakob, no solution, says Michael Stürmer, because uh, simply there will always be conflict places, if you will, in the world where people are suffering, whether in North Africa or, or mainland Africa. What do you make of this argument? So, so where is the solution then at the end of the day? Is there a solution or is there none, as Michael Stürmer suggests? Well, there is, of course, 
going to be uh, problems all over Africa in the future as well. But the point is not that everyone from Africa wants to come here. It's not that everyone wants to get to Europe. The um, history of Germany and the history of Europe shows that not necessarily in the moment that the migration policy is being more liberated and, and more open, everyone comes in. The first, the first time the freedom of movement within the European Union has been introduced, everybody was fearing that the uh, people from the poor southern European countries would come up uh, and move in the north. When the extension of the European Union toward the east, towards East Germany has come, everyone said people will flee from the post-socialist countries in the eastern, uh, eastern region and they will come to Western Europe because there are more jobs, there are higher wages and everyone is going to leave its home. And finally, 2011, when the restrictions for the um, job seekers from the uh, uh, Eastern European countries in uh, Bulgaria and Romania have been re relieved and they got the right to come in and uh, seek for jobs within the Europe EU's labor market, everybody was fearing that they were going to come in, they were going to work for dumping wages, they were going to ruin the German or the Central European labor market and the social systems, and none of this has happened. But let's be very concrete mm. here. The 300 people who died off the coast of Lampedusa mainly came from Eritrea and Somalia, two countries that are in... Failed states. Uh, failed states, mm. uh, if you will, human rights abuses, rampant human rights abuses. Mm. Uh, what do we do with these countries? What do we do with the situation as a European nation, as Germany, as Italy, as Spain, mm. as France? How can we help? where there are basically two possibilities. One is to keep everything as it is, to, to, to Europe sh can lie, continue lying to itself, saying that it is binded to human rights and to the Geneva Refugee Convention, saying that there is a possibility for people in need, for people who are persecuted to get protection here, and at the same time continue to seal off its borders and, uh, and keep on watching how the people who try to come here, to, to try to get protection here, die or it can start to take uh, the Geneva Convention and its obligations to the human rights serious and open the corridor for people to get in. What do, we, what do you make of the arguments uh, that some people put forth? Uh, let, let's try to fight the source of the problem. Mainly, let's try to improve the living conditions uh, of those peoples uh, in, in Africa and Northern Africa. Well, I, I'm all for it, but it's basically feeding aspirin where uh, really cholera is the disease and then take a problem like the Syrian civil war. Syria is falling apart. Nobody has the faintest idea of what kind of Syria, if at all, will there be in five years time or in ten years time. Meanwhile, uh, one tenth of the Syrian population has fled the country and probably uh, another half of the population would like to do so. Uh, what? The minimum we must do, apart from all the reasonable things that have to be done, the minimum we must do is differentiate between uh, refugees who are driven out of their normal habitat through war and civil war, and who may, and we may help them very much with temporary shelter. Temporary. But this and is exactly that what would, is not happening. Uh, this is, this is very, it's of course very difficult to say temporary, how long, under what conditions, allowed to work or not to work. Um, of course, I'm quite aware of that, but it would help to take away some of the domestic pressure. The German interior minister is also working under enormous domestic pressure. We don't want an extreme right wing and an extreme left wing party to sort of uh, make hay of, 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 of this very real problem. So the debate in Germany reflects very much the dilemmas, the tragic dilemmas we, we are face, faced with. La Laura looking here, we have a clear conflict here. We have a clear conflict between um, the human rights laws that Christian Jakob has mentioned and perhaps the realpolitik domestic policies, uh, shackles of domestic policy, uh, policies that each politician perhaps is bound to. How to solve this? Uh, I think there are a few things that can be done uh, in the short term. And in the long term, of course, you can talk about um, better, uh, try to improve the condition of life of the people uh, um, going away, the, but the, the illegal immigrants by 
maybe uh, agreements with the, with the government uh, uh, from where those people are escaping. But uh, uh, I'm not talking about the refugees, but the illegal uh, immigrants, of course. We have to distinguish, I, I agree, uh, between uh, uh, refugee or asylum seekers and uh, illegal immigrants. So for Italy, in this moment, the problem is all together because they're coming all together and uh, uh, they have to deal with the, with the issue on, on, the, on the spot, on a small island, Lampedusa, where there are like a few thousand people living. And uh, um, I think on the, on the issue of asylum seekers, we can do something by improving the condition uh, uh, or, or to receive asylum in, uh, in Europe and to create corridors, to, to uh, defend this corridor, to, uh, to help these people uh, in, in the sea, in the international water. And, uh, and uh, on the illegal immigration, there are, there we can do more on the spot by, by trying to stop these people to, to come maybe or uh, trying to uh, reach agreements with the government. There are the two different things that has to be done in the short term, but I think uh, what, what Europe should do uh, it's to deal the frontier, the southern frontier with the, in the Mediterranean Sea as it was at the European frontier and not, not like, a different, uh, like different countries' frontier. That would be the first step to, do, to, to find a common solution. Uh, but you have, of course, the problem of national citizenship. We are all, in a way, in an almost virtual way, citizens of Europe, right? But essentially, when it comes to civil law, to the welfare, we, Europe is an, the Europe of nations. Mm -hmm. And that's why this idea, it sounds wonderful, but it's far ahead of reality. And there seems to be an inherent unfairness here vis-a-vis uh, -vis some countries in, in the broader context here. If we look at the numbers, de facto only 10 EU nations have to deal, if you will, with the uh, coming of these asylum seekers, whereas uh, the remaining 18 countries, there are 18 EU countries that uh, do virtually nothing about it, mainly also due to the Dublin regulation, which you mentioned, Christian Jakob, namely that the asylum requests have to be handled by the country that the asylum seekers arrive and where they, uh, um, you know, ask for uh, asylum. So that basically leaves countries like Italy, Greece and Malta always at the forefront. Uh, at, there seems to be no concessions, though, on the part of the northern EU countries. Well, there is con consciousness, of course, but it is very comfortable the way it is. It is super comfortable and that's the reason why this regulation has been established by the Central European countries. Um, there, there are uh, propositions to make a, 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 to, to, to build up, set up a system to distribute the entire influx of uh, asylum seekers equally over all European countries relative to uh, the uh, size of the population and to the, um, to the economic power of the countries. But uh, since 2004, the, Euro the EU has tried to set up a new asylum system. They have been negotiating on this for five years. The negotiations have finished in uh, December of last year and since June the uh, new asylum system is in power and nothing has, has changed. It is still the same. The entire asyl European asylum architecture leaves the burdens on the countries at the external borders, which are the weakest and poorest. And many people are asking themselves, not only in Europe abroad, how could this tragedy have been prevented? And in the context of these questions, always uh, the name of the agency Frontex emerges. And let's have a quick look at the role and the purpose of this agency. Frontex is an EU agency tasked with watching Europe's borders and preventing people from entering without papers. It works with and coordinates the border agencies of the EU member states. But its budget has been cut drastically over recent years. Some politicians say Frontex needs more money for more patrols. They say it doesn't just stop illegal immigration. It also saves the lives of refugees trying to cross the Mediterranean in tiny vessels. But critics have accused it of endangering lives by stopping boats offshore and escorting them back to sea, breaking the law by denying people the right to claim asylum. Christian Jakob, uh is Frontex the, the problem here or the solution? Well, Frontex is neither the problem nor the solution. It is an instrument. It is an instrument of a European migration policy that mainly tries to prevent people from coming here. There is a huge contradiction 
between, on the one hand, the Geneva Convention saying people can come here if they are persecuted and we will grant them protection. And at the same time, since 2003, Europe is making huge efforts to seal off its borders. Frontex is one, one part of the system. Then the other one is being debated today in the European Parliament in Strasbourg. There is going to be a new European border surveillance system implemented from December on. It is called Eurosur. And its, ta its duty, equally as, as uh, the, the, the duty of Frontex, is to stop people who try to come here without a visa, which practically means any, anybody who seeks asylum here. Michael Stürmer, the European Union risks its own credibility and standing worldwide, doesn't it? Let's look at what happened in the aftermath of this tragedy. The victims are getting a state burial, whereas the remaining survivors of this tragedy are being prosecuted for trying to enter Europe illegally. Is that in any shape or form consistent with the ideals and values that the EU it's set a, out? It's a blatant case of d double standards, of course, but it's also an admission of helplessness. Uh, the state funeral uh, is so... Um, it's grotesque. It's grotesque. First, you force... Uh, you enforce a situation in which these things are bound to happen, sooner or later. Uh, near Lampedusa, near the Spanish coast, near the uh, Greek uh, islands. And then uh, you send in the, the big guys from the EU and they say the appropriate things. So does the Italian prime minister. And they cannot admit that they are helpless uh, because there is this push and pull from uh, Africa, from Syria, from the Arab uh, arc of crisis and everybody knows we cannot open the borders to everybody who is in need let alone who wants to come because this was would upset any social and moral balance inside our countries. Italy has always prided itself of being a country without racial prejudice and such things. Italianita, Italianita was something very liberal and a message to the world but since at least 10 years, if not 20 years, Italians have uh, seen that their beautiful cities are filling up with uh, ref black refugees from Africa selling all kinds of wares everywhere the same thing, so there must be a big organization behind it. And Italians are lost to admit that there is a problem with which the Italian state cannot cope. Now this has reached because not only of Lampedusa, but because, mainly because of Lampedusa, this has reached a point where I think things just cannot go on as they are. But I do not pretend I have a solution. There are many small solutions at, on, at the edges of the problem, but not at the center. Michael Stürmer says he doesn't have the solution. Do you perhaps have one, Laura Lucchini? Well, of course, uh, I mean, uh, the problem with the, with the illegal immigrants that stays in Italy has to do with this immigration law that we have, because uh, uh, those immigrants are um, uh, pr being pressing, pressed charge uh, for uh, illegal immigration. If they uh, don't have documents with them, uh, they can stay in Italy in an, an illegal way. There's no way to, to, even if they find a job, there's no way to, to change their status. So they will be illegal forever. There's no way that an employee with a good will can, uh, could change uh, the status of this, these people. That put a lot of pressure on uh, employees uh, and that put a lot of power uh, to mafia or people exploiting this situation. So that, that's why there are uh, a huge uh, organi uh, there are a huge organization that uh, they are uh, exploiting these uh, these people for to sell uh, uh, illegal uh, illegal stuff sometimes because those bags the the fake bags that they are selling in uh, on the street of Italian cities are illegal as well. And uh, uh, using these people, uh, for example, I don't know in tomatoes uh, um, uh, camps uh, in, uh, in the southern Italy uh, under the constant threat uh, of being uh, denounced to the police. So, so that, that's a problem that we have with this law, that, that, that there has been the instrument at least to change the status of these people. But Christian Jacob, of course, this problem is not just an Italian problem, quite on the contrary, it's a European problem. Let's touch upon the issue which has come up a few times here, namely the issue of trafficking. Uh, the 
the smugglers uh, that are profiting, if you will, from from the the uh, the, the, the the bad fortune uh, of these people coming uh, to Europe or trying to come to Europe. There is an argument that they're saying closing the borders will give even more powers to the traffickers. It will not solve the problem. Quite on the contrary, it will exacerbate the problem. Would you agree? Well, the entire trafficking business is just a reaction on the Frontex policy. As long as the border is totally sealed off, there will be traffickers. If there would be no traffickers, people would die anyway because they would try to organize the boats on their own. They wouldn't stop in North Africa. They would try to get boats to, to set over to the uh, Italian shores, to, to the Spanish coast, and the situation would be the same. So it's not the human traffickers who are to blame for what is happening, for example, in Lampedusa. It is the fact that there is simply no way to legally enter Europe. Hans-Peter Friedrich, once more the German interior minister, said something in the context of this tragedy. He says, as much as we regret uh, the casualties, of course, it needs to be stated and made clear that most of these asylum seekers, uh, generally speaking, are economic migrants not political refugees. Uh, would you, does, does, do the numbers, and you know this issue quite well, do the numbers back up his statement? Well, it is true that not everybody who, co who comes over to Italy in a boat is a political refugee, and there are uh, labor migrants. There is la uh, labor migration, it has, been, it has been there always, and it will be like this in the future as well. But we should stop to regard this as a problem. Uh, migration research and also um, uh, 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 macroeconomists are claiming that Europe and Germany needs immigration and it does not only need immigration from within the European uh, Union but also from outside. There are different numbers on this but even a, a commission that has been installed in the uh, late 1990s by the party of Minister Friedrich, the C CDU, has, has tried to, to uh, uh, somehow evaluate how high the necessity of immigration for the European economy is, and for the German economy is. And they said that at least 100,000 people should move in every year in order to satisfy the necessity of the economy and to avoid that the European society shrinks. Michael Schirmer, how helpful is this distinction between economic migrants and pol political refugees? Uh, at the end of the day, they're all on the boats, they're all trying to come here, and they are all uh, if you will, taking the risks uh, to get here. So what does it matter at the end of the day why they're coming? Now, economic migrants are not necessary. They, perhaps they have a chance to adapt and make a useful contribution in the countries of arrival. Uh, even where they are at first, uh, in the first place, are not very welcome. I do not believe that uh, 100,000 refugees from Syria or from Eritrea can really re be the answer to the problem uh, that we are facing in terms of European demographies, because it's more or less the same everywhere. Um, you have to, I mean, bringing in refugees who in, in, take the people from Syria, probably 99% of them w would love to stay in Syria, which is a beautiful country, very civilized, uh, great cultural benefits, but the situation being what it is, Syria is falling apart, hundreds of thousands of people are fleeing, tens of thousands are dead. Uh, they have never want, they never wanted to settle down in Europe uh, and their qualifications to make a decent living are in many cases good, in even more cases probably very bad. This is not uh, this, this spontaneous, uncontrollable migration is not the answer to what we really need in the medium and long term. And let's look very briefly the last round because we are running unfortunately out of time. What is it that we need? What, what needs to be done here in the light of this tragedy? Give us a couple of concrete factors. A combination of factors that are working on our side and then working on the other side. Uh, that includes development aid, but it also includes policing, it includes 
explaining and enlightening people. People have overblown ideas of the paradise, the land of milk and honey that awaits them on the northern shores of the Mediterranean. Laura Lucchini, what, what, what is your proposal here? I think we should establish a force aid forces in the Mediterranean from the European side and it also should be organized in formation centers or places where the people could, the, the asylum, asylum seeker could go to, to get information and to, to travel safer. There are two things that could be done in the short term. So. Christian Jakob, we've talked about the pros and cons here on this show extensively. Last word uh, goes to you. What does the EU need to do now? Euro the European Union needs to stop to regard migration as a threat. It needs to um, allow refugees to get in legally without risking their lives and dying in the Mediterranean Sea while trying to get to Europe. And the European Union needs to, st uh, to set up a system that equally and fairly distributes the burdens of asylum uh, amongst other member states. And do you think that will happen, realistically speaking? I'm afraid it is not so likely. And uh, so, so a rather pessimistic tone then, if, if I understand you correctly. Well, we have seen in the last 20 years that the policy has always been towards the, the, um, the prevention of immigration and I'm afraid that just because this time 300, has, 300 people have been dying in one day, that this is not going, going to change so easily. Well, the EU ministers, EU interior ministers in Luxembourg could not come to an agreement and the uh, EU asylum policies are still not unified and common. And I'm afraid we too on the show could not find uh, common ground, but I think we've highlighted very well the issues that are at stake here. And we will, of course, here at Quadriga continue to follow the story very closely. I want to thank my guests for their opinions, their insights into this very intricate and complex, not black and white issue. I want to thank you out there for tuning in and looking forward to seeing you again next week for a new edition of Quadriga.